Alright, uh, your full name? Ralph H. Osterhout. And today's date? December 7th, 2002. Uh, what service did you enter in? What branch of the military? I was, I was in the uh, regular army, in the 328 Signal uh, Aviation for Hickam Field, Hawaii. That's what I signed up for when I first went in. Uh, what kind of made you want to join the, that that branch? Well, <clears throat> I had I went, I, it was uh, I had no job. I just got out of high school, and it was a case of uh, someplace to go. So I went on text to the to talk and draft, and I uh, they told me this is one old first thing I know. Did you, did you graduate from high school? And I said yes. And he says, Well, we got a such a job for you for. Uh, it's just, you got to be a high school graduate. And I says, he says, where do you want to be stationed? And I said, well, either close to home or as far as ways I can get. And he said, well, we have, we have places in uh, Panama, Alaska, Hawaii. And soon he had Hawaii. I said, that's the place for me. And he said, well, he said, that's all right. And he said, right on. I knew right then just what I was going to be in. And he said, well, it's going to be the Signal Corps. You've got to be a graduate to get in there. So that's the reason that I got that. Did you go to a basic training before Hawaii or anything? Uh, a little basic, a little short arm, a uh, little uh, short drills and things like that, but I uh, was down to Port Slocum for three months, and then they uh, did a, went over there and had a little close out of drill and went out over to Hawaii, but no real basic training. Uh, how long did you serve for? Altogether, uh, like uh, 24, to be, uh, 24 days to be in five years. I signed up for three. <laughs> uh, so, what was what was the first like when you got to Hawaii? What did you think of it since you'd never been there before? I had never been there. It was beautiful. It was nice. Uh, just to compare things, we landed in Honolulu and went from Honolulu out to Hickam Field on a little narrow gauge railroad through a sugarcane field. You go out there now, there's no sugarcane field, there's no narrow gauge railroad around. So it, it's all built up, but it was it was nice there. Everything was just it's a, almost a new field. It, they've been going uh, building on that for just a few years, not too many years. What were some of the duties you did while you were there? <clears throat> uh, me, my, I was assigned to teletype, which was, well, I took typing in school, and that's what set me up for type typing. Otherwise, my minor, my sole duty was teletype up, up for a while, and I, from there I went into clerical work, and on into, uh, uh, ended up uh, driving a staff car. Well, that's a long story there, but I had drove a colonel around, and he was from Buffalo. He was radar special, and we flew inner island plus our, the island itself. Checking our radar, all our radar stations, and that was a real exciting trip. That was those were. How long were you there before the Pearl Harbor attacks? A year. A year. Mm -hmm. When did you? Did anyone sense the attacks coming at all? They, oh yes, uh, we we had planned all all that summer. I got there in January uh, January 41, and all our all most of our training was geared for potential things like that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, air uh, alerts, we were on the alerts. I kept a diary, I mean, I had them home. We kept a diary and uh, probably four or five times a month from, i uh, say, uh, April right up, up until the hip. We were on uh, alert. So it was, uh, we were expecting something going on all the time. Uh, what was it like the morning of December 7th when you first found out? The morning of December 7th, I, <clears throat> I first saw the Mr. Breakfast, so I went down and I went and had my breakfast, and the fellow came into the other room, he says, you, he says, uh, you go down and relieve uh, Jerry Lox, he's on guard duty down at our radio station. And I says, yeah, I'll do that. And I says, I said, let me go back and change my clothes. And I says, he says, I'll, uh, no, I'll get on relieving. He said, no, you'll only be gone 15, 20 minutes. He said, you'll be back in no time. Just go down as you are. Oh, okay. So I, he had a, he had a uh, 
jumped my car there and I jumped in that and went down to where he was to the radio station and and the uh, sergeant in charge there, he, he says the uh, taps are going to hit again this morning because we're geared for something going to happen because the Army, Navy, they're always zooming the fields that every weekend. And this particular morning, uh, well, he says the taps are going to hit this morning. And so Ed and I, he was from Vermont, we were outside, just standing outside the uh, power station in these and I was looking up over Pearl, was, of course, Pearl and Hickam was just a fence between the two. And I said, Ed, I said, here comes some planes in from uh, Schofield. <clears throat> so we're watching, and the first, they came in a V formation, three planes. And the first plane peeled off the right, and he dropped something. I said, Ed, he dropped something. And then the second one, he peeled over, and he dropped. He dropped something there too, and I said, well, he did the same thing. And about that time, the third of me dropped over, and by that, this time, I don't know, that was more than a matter of maybe a minute, and the first plane was overhead. And that's when we see the big red star, and we knew it was the Japanese. That was, we couldn't believe it. Could you see, did you see the destruction it caused, or did you see the bombs fall? I, 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 I see the I see the bombs leave the planes. I didn't see them hit because there's the tree line is just high enough above pearls so we couldn't see what what they hit or anything. As far as on um, Hickam Field, <coughs> where where we had our radio station that morning, originally the oil uh, supply and all our fuel was supposed to have been on this particular field. It was a baseball field at this time. And we were, our uh, radio station was just off the side of this field. <clears throat> we found out later that the Japanese thought that this field was still, that we had the uh, storage there. They, uh, they did, they dropped two big bombs in there, and I'm, I'm guessing 500 pound bombs in that field. Luckily, I mean, I was far enough away so I didn't, we could feel the concussion, we didn't get hit. And, uh, <clears throat> and when two soil I had went over uh, being on teletype, our tele signal office was just a short distance away. I run over there and I, I send out a message over to, to uh, Fort Shafter, who was headquarters of the Warren Department, and I told them the Japanese were bombing uh, Pearl Harbor and Hickman Field. And uh, this guy on the other side, he gave me a baloney of uh, answers, and, and I said, I said, This is for sure, real. I said, I'm not kidding. I said, I said, they're all over this uh, place right now. And I said, I, I, I don't know anything. SOS, SOS. I said, I said, this is sure. I said, I'm going back to duty. I went back on duty. Well, I got back to duty, and I went and told Ed, I said, I'm back. And I got across this field where they bombed there. And the fellow came across the field. He had his left arm. It was just hanging, tangent or something and hanging. And uh, his arm was still hanging, dangling there. And I, and I said, God, I said, Ed and I, we wanted to give him courage. Stop him from bleeding himself. He said, no. He said, I got a hold of this. Get me to the hospital. And I, I jumped in the car and I took it up to the hospital. And I think I probably took the first one to the hospital. But coming from the hospital back, I came back onto Singer Avenue. <clears throat> and I, I'm, I'm moving. You know, I'm, the caps are all in the air. And I'm probably hitting 60, 65, 70 miles an hour, whatever the fast that vehicle would go. And uh, of course, I see this plane come down my the avenue where I was going. Well, I knew I had to pull the right. And I pulled the right, went over where I was, and I jumped out, went in, and told Ed. I, said, I made it back. But I said, Gun, they were a guy coming down there, he's aiming at me. <clears throat> and uh, we went back out about 10 minutes later and looked at the car. I had two bullet holes in that thing after I got back, but I never got injured. Just one of those lucky deals where I uh, survived that. But from there, that I went. I went to, the guy came back and relieved me. I went back on duty and running teletype. <clears throat> I don't remember much went on after that. Uh, up until it's probably around uh, almost dark, we were moving off the field, and we went back up into a Alamo and a crater. 
and it's an old deserted crater, but uh, they had tunnels built through it. And we set our headquarters, our, our signal section, the headquarters of the 7th Air Force. We went up into the, one of those tunnels. And that's where I stayed for the next three months. Was there a lot of confusion during the attacks, or people know what was going on? Yes, there was. From the time Signal Corps, we had telephone, teletype, radio. Uh, we were pretty old burst on anything, so everything was coming in, we, we could take a track of. And we were up in the position on, on this crater where we were, and we could go outside and look, and we could oversee Hickam and, and Pearl Harbor. So, uh, we were taking turns running out and seeing what was going on to kind of keep an eye on this. This is all, all times the first night. But the second night, <coughs> I, I figured my, my time was in with them because we started getting messages that unknown objects were sighted so many yards offshore. We uh, we relaying the relay message on. They kept getting closer and closer. And then there were these uh, trooper, troops were landing on the uh, uh, entrance to Pearl Harbor, Fort Hammond, and Hickam Field. And then, one too long after, then they said that. Troops were landing from paratroopers were landing out in such such a sugarcane field back in there. So we'd send messages out on that, and we would then they would uh, set fire to the sugarcane fields. So if it was they were landing troops, they were going to be running the red end of fire. <coughs> but uh, that went on all day long. I mean, gunners, we we figured then we were we were done for you. You looked out across, you couldn't, you couldn't see anything down around the fields themselves. There was black. Uh, then down in our center brick crater, we had our telephone hooked up, and they were shooting. Everyone would hear a shot going off, you know, and they figured, well, goodness, they, they got to be somewhere close by. So what, even if we went out, and we, we, we always kept pretty close eye on just what was going on. But uh, up until morning, <coughs> things uh, nothing had really happened. And but then, then we found out that uh, somebody had started a rumor. One thing led to another, and all these troop landing was all just a rumor. But I figured, boy, uh, that was the scariest moment. I figured that was my the my dying day that year. You feel they were attacking any one thing, or were they just hitting anything they could? No, nothing special. Could uh, I know? It, it, it took uh, the planes were all flying low all during the day, and it was probably, I say, maybe nine, nine thirty, ten o'clock in the morning before the some of the air and aircraft things got them out where they kept the plane perfectly up in the air. So then they were up there quite a ways, but they were they were dropping a lot of bombs uh, as far as strafing goes. I, I mean, I didn't I didn't see much of that because. I was in the I was on the hangar line and I was back on the field. How long did it take before you felt safe to walk out in the open? <clears throat> well, it was the it was the third day before we it was being in the field real fairly safe. Uh -huh. And it was probably oh I did I did go back on the field about three weeks afterwards. Just to see what was going on, just to pick up some things down there, supplies. And uh, from there, from there, it was just uh, routine things, and uh, take care of things. What had to be done. <coughs> uh, of course, uh, after, well, after, after we did uh, move back on the field, this was, I don't know really want to get back into this later, really. but being the uh, the they had a uh, major Pollen, Ed Pollen from. Buffalo came in there in our signal outfit, and he was a radar specialist. And uh, <clears throat> by this time, well, uh, this was in July, in July of '41, or July of '42. They, uh, <clears throat> with the radar, with him as radar, we had uh, he had this that Paulin had. Had to check on all these radar stations all around. Pick them, 
any any anything on the islands there, and the uh, the colonel, the driver for the colonel of the signal officer, Seventh Air Force. Uh, he had to have a new driver because he was going back for OCS. So they are looking for a new driver. And they came around and asked me if I would drive. And I said, yeah, I'll drive. Well, this this gave me the opportunity. I could, I could drive him around. And I drove for this Ed Pollard, who was a radar man. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people probably don't know. The people in Schofield they, they didn't know. <laughs> we had a radar station up above Schofield in the Coley Coley Pass. We would drive up, up through Schofield up the steep hill, and then off to the uh, right, and up this hill, park my car, and go up on the, up, up to the top of this hill, and the peak, and the uh, <coughs> uh, major, major pump, he, he says, come on with me. So we went with him from the, from the peak of this uh, mountaintop, over to the peak of the mountaintop with a cable car hand-powered and we hand-powered our way across from one mountain top the other and looked down and that and that is probably 200 feet down below and I was kidding but we made it across there we got up in there and they said well this is far as you can go because when he got the end of it because the radar he says it's, it's another 50 100 feet to back up in the this wagon back up in the uh, clouds <laughs> so I had I had to sit there and wait for him to come back up but that was that was excitement there, just following him around. And we did this island hopping down on the big island, different islands around there. Was the radar damaged at all? Uh, no, no, they they never. I don't think they knew it was up there. Uh -huh. and even the people in uh, Scoville didn't know it was up there. So it just uh, it was just knowing that the uh, radar was around. And they were lighter. How long did it take to regroup on the whole on the island as a whole? Like Pearl Harbor, the the Navy part and the Army part. Like, how long did it take to get to get things started back up again after the attack? Oh goodness! <laughs> I was there until July of '43, and uh, they were pretty well. I, I, I'm going to say that it was probably pretty close to a year before they really got much back to where they know what was going on. Uh, they just did a little more freedom around there. But I, I stayed there until 43, so I was... Were you able to explore the island to see all the damage that it got? That oh, yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, of course, I, I had a lot of buddies who were in the in the Navy, and uh, and I used to get down to Pearl quite a bit and, and see the ships upside down and when they were hit. And the damage was terrific here. Well, even on Hickam, the damage, the barracks on Hickam Field, uh, that was, that was uh, they strafed at it immensely. And they, the first thing they did, they got the bomb right in the middle of that uh, uh, barracks. Because right in the middle of the barracks was the main mess hall. And when I went first went out there in January of 41, everybody ate in that big mess hall. Now they had 40,000 people out there. But they didn't it on the day when everybody was eating there. Uh, but well, that by the time the chaps hit, then we had our own mess hall in another location. But they did drop a bomb right in the middle of uh, that mess hall, and they killed I think 69 or 79 people in that mess hall just that one month. But they strafed a big man, that, that big uh, barracks, and they just strafed that. And they still got the marks on the building. They just painted over them with shows the pocket marks where they hit. And all those hangers, they were nothing left of them. Planes still strewn around. I, I see them shortly after. Well, a couple of months after the uh, after they hit. Could you see the the aircraft carriers or any of their ships at all? Uh, there's no aircraft carriers there. All the aircraft carriers. That's what I say. I think they they knew because they were they were down on the detail down towards I think I say I think the Gilbert Marshall Island. But they were all out to there. They were heading back from down there back to Hawaii when the Japs hit. So they were, I think they said they were about 500 miles offshore when the uh, Japs hit. So they didn't get any damage? So no, the aircraft carriers didn't. No. But all the, all the, uh, goodness. The 
destroyers? The destroyers and the battleships and the cruisers, all, all of them. They were one too many survivors out of that. Very few. Do you think that the uh, the U.S. knew it was coming, like, and they didn't they didn't say anything? Like, there was any miscommunication? To no. Them? No. No. <laughs> So, uh, did you hear about the, any, the Doolittle raid after anything on Tokyo, like the strike back uh, a few months later? Well, no, they, uh, they, they talked about it, I heard about it, but there's nothing about any, any raid going on. They uh, <clears throat> wasn't really, there wasn't no real raid right, right off, right then, until yeah. uh, later on. So a couple of years, a year or so it was. About two years after it before they hit Tokyo. Did you guys, did you, did you know what was going on in, in the war in Europe, even while you were fighting in the Pacific? Uh, yeah, pretty much so. I, I kept track of the, uh, I'm a little advertiser, they, I always got the, there's a daily paper, and if I, would, if I didn't get it, well, I got it every Sunday paper, I got the Sunday paper every time. I kept up on the news that way. Yeah, uh, really that was my contact with the, <laughs> Outside world, and we, but that was that's a general topic. Anyway, everybody was talking war at that time. Do you think the, atta the attacks uh, fear made people fearful of fighting, or did it make people want to get back at the Japanese? Oh well, yeah. I, I took a dislike into the Japanese for a long time. Even came out of the came out of the service. Uh, you know, uh, you, you go into the go name any place you need. First thing I always look at, look at the silverware. Was it made in Japan? I'd get up and walk out. I used to do that. I, I wouldn't, if anything was made in Japan, I wouldn't uh, touch it. So, but uh, nowadays, I mean, it's a, it's a different story. You know, you, it's just one of the things that they were led by Hero Hero and his crew there, and that was a bad situation. They're just following the orders? You're just following orders, that's all. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? No. I think we got most of them. Is there any other stories you'd like to add? Any, any well, I would, I'd like to say one thing. Uh, of course, one thing that I've done, we're, we're finding out an awful lot, a lot of information nowadays that we didn't know before. And one thing was who uh, who's dropped the first mob the uh, first start of World War II. Somebody, everybody thinks Japan. It wasn't Japan, it was the United States. But that was that, that happened because of a submarine with this one man subs wanted to get back and get into Pearl Harbor and uh, blow up some of those ships in there. And so they, that, was before, they, huh? that was before the attacks even started? Oh yeah. Yeah, this is that this is the well, somebody was saying it was the day before, but I think it was I think it was about about a half hour before that happened that morning. But uh, what they did is they knocked, they, uh, when they fired on that, when they picked it up and they fired on it, they knocked the conning tower off that sub. But then they dropped the depth charges onto it. But then there was no proof that there was a uh, submarine around because they, didn't, they couldn't find the sub. Nobody knew anything about it. Of course, the information now is, is out that the, uh, uh, they finally did find the sub here about a year ago, and it was actually the, it was a sub that tried to get in the harbor. So it was, a, it was official that, uh, that Japan did try to get in the harbor that morning. A mini sub? It was a mini sub, yeah. Well, they, a lot of those one-man subs, mini subs. And those were also like kamikaze missions yeah, as well? Yeah, 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 yeah one, one man, and they, he either, either he survived or he didn't. That's the way, that's the way it went. What, you, what did you guys think about the kamikazes? Do you think they were just crazy? Or it, it, they had to be crazy. You couldn't believe the thing. But who would even thought Japan would have uh, bombed uh, Pearl Harbor? I mean, I, I didn't. I never thought they would. I never thought. It. Well, the same thing with this kind uh, of before. The uh, back in 1930. This is just information just come out. Back in 1937, the U.S. government let uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, 
Nihau, which is the furthermost island in the Hawaiian island group. And that's the nearest one towards, towards Japan. But then in 1937, the U.S. government got a hold of Mr. Robinson, who was in charge of that island, told him to get out and plow furrows all throughout that island. And because they figured, being the closest to Japan, that would be the first island that they want to land on if they're going to do anything. So come find out, they did. They they he plowed they plowed furrows all over the time. And the guy, according to the report out, they figured that he covered maybe 2,400 miles of furrows that they had plowed all over that island. As it turned out, a Jap plane did did land. Try to land there. He crashed, but he survived. But he got out of the plane, and then there was a couple of uh, people that worked uh, for Mr. Robinson. Uh, they, uh, uh, the the uh, Jap got them. They were looking for them because they they, they saw him land, crash him crash land, and the Jap uh, took took them prisoner. And was it one too many days after that, the man himself uh, escaped. But he, in escaping, he got out and got back and killed that Japanese. And the information just got out now because there was no information as to proof as to uh, who would, uh, if a Jap had uh, landed there. They knew it, a plane had landed, but didn't know what. But it was Japanese, and uh, they had proof that, that they uh, had taken a couple prisoners. And then they went, and then he had shot, this guy had shot the Japanese. Were the planes easy to differentiate, the American and the Japanese planes? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one thing. We we took an awful lot of schooling on that. In my, I don't know, in Singapore, I don't know why we got it, but we did. Everybody got that, I guess. But the, uh, we could tell just by design and the uh, signal on to it, because the signal was nothing to it. You would know, but you'll be able. To, you could almost pick up a long ways away, just what uh, outfit they belonged to, what country. Were they low flying during the attacks, or were they were they high? When they first started, they were all low flying. Well, they were probably. Well, let's see. Well, when he went over my head, the first one there, he was probably two hundred feet off the ground. He was, I mean, they were they were down. You can see them smiling. That was how close he was. Do you mind if I just break in? Oh, Ralph. Yeah, good, good to, to see you, Ed, buddy. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's full of crap. And, yeah. You know, whatever what he hear. tells you. Oh, is that on the TV? <laughs> hey, it's fine. <laughs> you got any stories for us? Oh, I'm not going to. I have so many of them. Yeah. It would it'd break your cameras. <laughs> he, he was on Wheeler Field. Uh, that's another field up next to Schofield, uh -huh. where this guy over here was. He was in Schofield. He was on Winterfield. He was that was a small uh, pursuit field. And right, Hickenfield was a big, a bomber. That's a bomber, heavy bomber. That's why it's Were there were there a lot of like spaces inside in the main like inland or were they was it mostly just the the harbor? Oh, oh no, goodness no. We we got them all over the island. Uh, they, uh, well, let's see. Let's see what name all of you. You got you got uh, Pearl, Hickam, Port Cam, uh, and then you got uh, Schofield, Wheeler Field, Canioi, Bellows Field. Uh, uh, let's see. There's, there's two more. There's two other two more fields up through there. There's quite a, there's quite a, pretty well fortified one through there. Do you know any numbers about how many? How many troops were there? All together, in the whole island? Well, I would... Well, I would say probably on the whole island, I would almost say maybe four or five hundred thousand, probably all together. Could be, uh, we had, uh, well, we'd favor. We had, we had, on Hickam Field, we had 40,000 there, we were feeding on Hickam Field, so that's just a small section of what, figuring all of uh, Pearl Harbor, all the ships there. And so I go I would say maybe, Four hundred thousand. Did they did they attack across the whole island? The Japanese did they attack across the whole thing? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Now they 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 bombed about everything. Going. They did very little bombing. They did they did strafe on the little, well, a little bit, not much. 
but most of it, most of it was they were just all geared for uh, military installations. Well, I think we're about to. Are they about to start the ceremony up? I think pretty soon. About ready, must be. Probably. All right. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Thanks a Thank lot. You. For okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If we took a picture with you. Yeah. All right. Very good.